I can't say my dad, you know, set me down and said, son, this is what you got to know. It was just, I just follow him around. We had a small farm, five acres and different kinds of plants, but he worked in an oil refinery to, for money. And he was real good at fixing things and also uh, cobbling up things, making things work. Uh, and I just sort of followed his ideas. And in high school, I was always wondering why things worked the way they did. I was on the stage crew. So I handled all the, you know, the microphone and speakers and things like that, which is something that nobody taught me. I just did it, you know, that kind of thing. Then uh, out of high school, I went into the Air Force, uh, worked electronics for uh, one year of school and one year in Korea and, one, and two years at Sacramento, <laughs> which happened to be where I lived. <laughs> it was real interesting. Spent two years at Davis in the military. It was hard for some people to believe. Yeah, then I went to Davis, that's two years, working with the radio transmitters there, so I learned that. And then talking with one of the guys who uh, I worked with, he was going to go to school and get an engineering degree, and I said, gee, that sounds good. So I went, uh, went to Berkeley and wasn't quite making enough money on the GI Bill so I worked half-time at the radiation laboratory up on the hill at Berkeley at the Cyclotron and Bevatron. And those are interesting. It was working, smashing small particles and seeing particles come from another possible universe. So I knew about Ampex because I had an Ampex tape recorder. So I went to Ampex and they had a job that, you know, fit what I did. I'm sort of a seat of the pants, not a big theoretical person, but just someone who knows how to get things done. And the job that was open at Ampex at that time wanted that type of a person, so I did it. The transistor technology that I learned about uh, working at the radiation laboratory really helped me a lot at Ampex. So immediately when I started in at Ampex, I was working one of the the engineers there sort of took me under his wing, and uh, I was working with him with my transistor knowledge that I knew, and we built an audio recorder which had incredible characteristics, just beat any audio tape recorder on the market at that time, 1962 it would be this time. Uh, we demonstrated it to the owner of Ampex, Alexander Amponatov, AMP, and the EX stands for excellence. <laughs> anyway, Alexander just thought this was great, so he told us to take it to the audio people and uh, see about turning that into a product. So we took it to the audio people and said, nah, didn't want it, because we already got a good tape recorder with a vacuum tube. So, okay. Uh, you know, they're, they're felt that they had gone as far as they needed to go and keeping the noise down and everything. But people like Dolby didn't believe so. Dolby was an engineer there. At, at and, Ampex? Yeah. What was his, what's Dolby's first name? Ray. Ray Dolby. There's two Dolby's, Dale Dolby and Ray. Both of them from Redwood City. Okay. So they're local boys. <laughs> I think it's in 1951 that Sarnoff, uh, the head of RCA, was the, the the keynote speaker at a uh, where they, they opened the Sarnoff Laboratories in Princeton, New Jersey, and at that time, he said that there are three things that needed to be developed in electronics. One of them is the uh, CRT for color television, to be very precise, and it had to get the cost way down. And the other is to record uh, video on tape or some kind of optical or magnetic, he didn't care. The audio tape recorder had was started in Germany in 35 and picked up in the United States around 46, just to give you some timeline issues on uh, where the timelines are. Uh, anyway, um, what happened with Ponitov picked up on that and he liked the idea, so he hired a guy out of See, Charles Ginsburg, uh, 
He wanted someone who wasn't stuck in his ways. He wanted someone who was a maverick, you know, out thinking outside the box, and, but yet not being afraid of taking on a challenge. And he figured that's what was needed for uh, someone to develop a videotape recorder, and he was absolutely right. So Ponita picked a perfect person. And he got a couple of three people to work for him, but then one day Ponatov got a telephone call that got a very important person coming in to meet you at one o'clock today. Uh, so this guy drives up in his limousine and comes in and sits down and it turned out to be Michael Todd. So Todd wanted Ampex to develop a theater system for Taddeo. And Ampex did and got an Oscar for it. <laughs> so they built several. There's only one existing that I'm aware of and it's a one of our engineers at Ampex uh, has it in his home. <laughs> the speakers are about 20 feet tall, so <laughs> he never turns the volume up. He, he lives out in a rural area, but I know his neighbor also. So, <laughs> so it's got to be I'll good for. Try not to laugh on camera. <laughs> That's a good so, point. Oh, anyway, this is 51, 50, 51, 52. So Ponatov said, you know, he has to scrap, forget that the videotape. Can't do it, so we can't do both. So he did, okay, we do the Tadio system. And he did, and that took a couple of years. Uh, so after that, Ponatov then put the guys back on the team for developing the videotape recorder. And I should say, in the meantime, Charlie Ginsburg had been working on it on his own, uh, sleeping in his office, and just really incredible. He just totally dedicated, wasn't getting paid, but uh, he could use you know, expertise when he needed to, you know, talk with someone. Ponatov let him have a lot of leeway. Well, the Kennys were used, uh, it's what they call the kinescope, the copying uh, the film uh, for television. Oh, kinescope is a machine for, that would transfer uh, film over to, you know, 60 cycle, uh, 30 frame rate, so, to, so you could put it out on video television. You can't put film out on TV. Yeah, well, where they are operating in the 40s and the 50s in the television industry was they would film a show uh, and, you know, they, uh, or two ways. One is they either film a show or they do it live. And some people refused to do it live. So if they make a mistake, you know, it really blows it you know, really bad. So they, they did not like that. So they liked the idea of using a kinescope, but then the kinescope would degrade the picture from the, you know, the camera itself just straight in out onto the air was real good being live. So they didn't like, uh, the, and the broadcasters prefer going live. But uh, the so the kinescope is the only answer, and the best kinescopes were not really that good or just acceptable. Yeah, at that time, I should say it was four or five thousand dollars for a kinescope for a kinny. So it was expensive. That was another reason why the networks didn't like using it. They preferred going live. Ginsburg is the guy in charge of the, developing the videotape recorder. Before. Ponitov was going to fund it. He wanted to know what progress Ginsburg had done. So Pring Ginsburg took him into a dark room and showed him. And the story I've heard is when they turned the lights back on, Ponitov asked Ginsburg, which one was the horse and which one was the Indian? Okay, so the first images weren't very good? <laughs> <laughs> Horrible. Okay. Horrible. Uh, and they're black and white or color? That the, oh, oh heaven, black they, and white. They didn't even play with colors. Forget, they forget. Yeah. They're, the color is a whole different world. Okay. There are several companies, Dumont, not DuPont, but Dumont in Chicago, and uh, maybe about a half a dozen companies were de trying to develop a videotape recorder by running regular tape recorder at high speed. Hmm. So they run 120, it was 20 miles an hour or 40 miles an hour. Pretty damn fast. Problem is the... the get air film. So the tape was not touching the head. So they're originally yeah. trying to do it in a straight line, right? Yeah. Okay. So use a large reel. 
maybe two feet in diameter or something, very large, maybe half inch wide tape, different width. And anyway, Bing Crosby was uh, in on this, trying to fund it with uh, Jack Mullen, who's another, who's a person who was famous in the audio, developing the audio recorder. And that was BCE, uh, Bing Crosby Enterprises. They were in Hollywood. And they were, they were, I think they were going 120 inches per second, which is about, I think that's 20 miles an hour. They might use multiple heads, like they might use 10 heads over a half inch wide tape, and each head would record a band like maybe 50 cycles per second to 100, another would record 100 to 500, another 500, you know. So they break up the frequency spectrum and uh, record all that at the same time. Well, the low frequencies came through real good, but the high frequencies were terrible, so they got very poor resolution. And, Back to the horse and Indian problem. <laughs> Ponatoff heard about a guy in Chicago with, that had made a recording by rotating, getting the head at high speed and going across a very wide tape, having, a, I don't know if it was two inches or four, I think it was four inch tape. I uh, got, probably got from 3M. Uh, so I made a recording going across, but he had a lot of problems with it, but he did show it publicly. So that means he lost the patent on it, which is very crucial in later years. <laughs> the patents are a whole different ball game, a whole different world uh, in this area. Anyway, uh, so anyway, Ponatoff and Harold Lindsay, his uh, chief engineer, and Walt Felstead, I think was the other, well, he and Harold were some, something like chief engineer at that time. Uh, they liked that you know, going higher speeds, rotating the head, getting the head rotating. One of the guys on the team was Alex Maxey. Alex uh, was a brilliant person. Uh, invented the word glitch, for example. <laughs> he invented a lot of words that uh, we can't repeat. <laughs> Very colorful person. And where did he get the word glitch from? Uh, just the word he made up. He, okay. he just make up words. They come in and work and just say the damnedest thing. You know, here we are peeling back the foreskin of science. <laughs> you know, things like that. It just, you know, just totally off the wall person. And that's the way he thought. And he came up with an idea of, you know, how to curve. He, he, he thought he could cup the tape and have a vacuum holding the back side of the tape, which is critical. Uh, the problem was trying to get a small diameter motor that could get up to a high speed that he needed. And what they were working, they thought they had to do 2,000 inches per second, which I think is 90 miles an hour, as I recall. Something like that. For the that. head or for the tape? For the head. Okay. Tape is almost not going. The tape can be moved. It depends on how wide your track, your head is. But they could make the heads as narrow, narrow as you wanted them almost. Uh, Anyway, so it's Alex Maxey who came up with this idea of wrapping it around a drum <laughs> or cupping it. And that's the helical. And the helical, it can be wrapped 180 degrees around or 360 or, well, VHS is something like 190 you know, degree wrap, maybe 200, but something like that. What was wrong with the, the rotor, the, the one where you go across the tape? That had a lot of problems at first, and the fact is that they had to come in and cut the tape. So it was very damaging to the tape, so you had to have things adjusted just right. So mechanical, you had to have four heads on a drum about that, you know, two inch diameter or something like that. And the uh, four heads and record and then four play, and use the same four and playback, but you had to do a lot of jury rigging to do that. The four-headed, you know, the two-inch tape, uh, let's say had a lot of problems. Interchanging tape. You could not record a tape on one machine and play it back on another machine. Tape Think machine. about that. Well, you're, you're going between, they have fixed guides about 16 inches apart, as I recall, 
and in between you have this motor which is maybe an inch and a half in diameter which could run at a very high speed. Uh, I ran one at 700 revolutions per second. Think about that. In one second, this head was going 700 revolutions. Mind boggling. I wasn't what the standard is, but I, mean, I just, I had it a setup in a cement pile and bricks and iron and everything I could get out in the parking lot and ran it up with a special unit to do it. We, just, we wanted to see how far we'd go. Got 700 revolutions per second going fine. Well, that's then became a military recorder. <laughs> when they found out they could record such high speed and it's still being used by the military. I think it's the only video recorder at Ampex still supplying parts to, <laughs> that recall. Uh, Charlie Anderson and Alex Maxey were living together in an apartment in Redwood City. And they were talking about, you know, curving the tape and stuff. And uh, they had a, a roll of toilet paper and they just wrapped it around, <laughs> took an empty, you know, thing and wrapped it around it. And, you know, uh, Maxey said, gee, why can't we do that with a tape? You know, why do we have to cup the tape? So. I, Tried going that way, but they'd gone so far with uh, the uh, rotary, the uh, transfer scan, that uh, uh, I guess Pen you know, Ponatov and Gensberg decided not to go that route. So that put the helical on the shelf for a few years, but Alex uh, Maxi kept playing around with it, or at least he kept the, the uh, models. But it was so expensive that nobody kept uh, recordings. So it wasn't until probably 1961 or 62 that uh, we got a, a what we call a time-based correction system that could make it where you could interchange tapes from one machine to another. Uh, then they stopped erasing. So you have, uh, to, to my knowledge, there's only one transfers tape alive today that's prior to 1961, which is the year I got there, but that's coincidental. You record the same heads and the same tape and put it on another machine. And as I say, before that, before that, it, there are so many errors that the picture is just going all over the place. Ah, pretty good, yeah. But you, oh, you had banding problems. <laughs> okay. So every four heads, if, if the heads weren't exactly aligned properly at exactly 90.00 degrees and 180.00 uh, and spaced properly from one to the other, then uh, you had problems. It, it, and the banding would be those stripes, right? Yeah. You see on the old shows sometimes. So, right. Okay. And um, you, you can't get rid of, if it's really bad banding, you can't get rid of it. You just cannot do it. So we introduced the time-based corrector, which would... Uh, it would strip out the vertical hole. It would. It would take. Yeah. It would make it start on the left side, so it would force it in effect to the left of the screen. So. Oh, so yeah. So that's zero. Period. From then on. And then from yeah. there, if you if the time based correction wasn't correct, you would just creep it up or down. Yeah, right? it might go up or down two and a half lines or. But at least it would be all over the place. It would be a steady signal that would right. be out of it, the line would be in the middle. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we went from two inch to one inch. Were you involved in that process? When, sure, when did you sure come in? was. <laughs> did you come in when two inch was there? Well, you get into a confusion here because there's two two inches. Or oh, three, okay. there's three two inch. Oh, that's right, yeah. There's three of them. <laughs> it gets very confusing. Let's say Ampex was in Opelika, Alabama, and that, they were making audio tape. <laughs> But not very good, as I understand. But uh, they were making a living; it was a business. Uh, so Ampex engineers like Ginsburg were working with 3M. Happened to have a, a manager at 3M that really liked taking a risk, you know, developing a new product line if he could. In 1956. 3M was making several batches of tape with different little bits of difference in formulation. 
what they're doing, they're working with the binders. Because the problem here, you know, longitudinal heads, the tape just flies over the head. But with a rotary head, the head goes into the tape. I mean, literally. It, it makes a tent. But it's a slight air film inside that tent if the tape and the head are designed properly. And that was my specialty at Ampex. Every recorder I worked on, I made damn sure that the heads and tapes matched. But they, this guy could see that, well, if they got a better binder for video, it should work better for audio in 50, 1956. So they had the machine was pretty well designed, but they didn't have a tape that would hold up. So it could literally cut, if you stopped, it would cut the tape in half. I just boom, all of a sudden you got two tapes. So they got the NAB show in Chicago coming up, is where they're going to introduce the videotape recorder. This is in spring of 1956. And uh, they only had one tape that was really working. And this guy at the 3M uh, made an effort working day and night for a couple of three days to get a tape that would be better than the one that was in Redwood City. But uh, by the morning of the day that he had to get it to Chicago, uh, they still didn't uh, have it. But he was going to go to the, see the unveiling of what they had, you know, poor, much poorer quality video. Uh, but just before this plane took off, one of the guys working for him had another reel that worked. So they went up to the pilot, you know, from the ground. You know, this is one with a tail in a kind of plane, a C-46. And the op pilot opened the window, and this guy had a long stick and said, this is the medication for the doctor so-and-so was on the plane. <laughs> <laughs> and it got there. So they were able to do the press conference in Redwood City with one reel of tape and do the NAB show you know, for CBS in Chicago uh, for one tape. And the reason we went two inch is because, well, we felt everybody's got two inch tape. So why not just stay with two inch? Why go to a, a narrower tape? Turned out that we couldn't use regular two inch transverse tape anyway. So halfway through the project, we saw, whoops, we screwed up. It should have been one inch. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Did it end up being one inch? Yeah, no, two inch. Stayed two inch. And that uh, still several. That's that's had a long history. But if you wanted to edit two inch tape, <laughs> what was involved? <laughs> what size of scissors do you have? Yeah. Uh, well, tell you my joke on that one. It was a Democratic convention in in Atlantic City in 1964, which is August. I think it was August 64, that we introduced the two-inch helical tape recorder. That was the first time it was used. Okay, the chief engineer at ABC was Frank Marks. And he's one of these guys that knew how to get things done. Well, before this, I had invented the instant replay. And all that is is taking a two-inch tape, which is wrapped around the scanner, uh, and stopping the tape. Just don't let the tape move. And if you stop the tape just right, you would get the picture frozen on the screen. That had never been, you'd never be able to do that before. It had to do how I discovered instant replay is at this time, if you stopped the tape on a quad machine, it would cut the tape. I just saw the tape in there. Uh, so, I got some new tape from 3M for trying on the helical machine. And I threaded it on, played it, and making measurements. And the phone rang in the lab. And uh, I stopped it and went to the phone, came back about a half hour later. The picture is still on the screen. I go, whoa! <laughs> That's significant. You, you forgot to shut down the heads or something? Yeah. So I wasn't supposed to do that. <laughs> so this is incredible. And one of the other guys you know, I was working with was standing nearby. He was working nearby and he looked over and said, hmm, hey, that's fun. You know, playing around with it. We can make the guy dive into the pool and then go back onto the board. 
I've never been able to do that before. How did it stay in sync, though? I mean, if you went it, backwards... It huh? didn't. Oh. Yeah, the sync bar would go through the screen. I got you. That's okay. I mean... You can fix that. Football, you know, uh, fans don't give a damn if there's a sync bar oh, running through the picture. They so didn't seriously, care. Seriously, they, they had a sync bar originally? Oh, heavens, yeah. Really? It was really wide. Pretty bad. And it was black and white. No color. You could never That's make it color. You could never get anything synchronized. Anyway, we're playing around with it, and we really couldn't see, okay, this is fun. What do we do with it? But anyway, talking with our project manager, John Streets, and we agreed, well, just put a knob and a switch on the machine, and that's all it takes. So we did. And uh, we drove around with a station wagon that had a top open, and I was the cameraman <laughs> with, you know, taped some of the football players at Stanford and did baseball and things and could really couldn't see how to use it. Still didn't see a use. So when the Ampex demonstrated to the networks, Frank Markson uh, at uh, ABC, that's it. <laughs> Bingo. Bars and all. He saw it. He didn't care. Had to just ignore the bars. He saw it. Uh, it's a man after my own heart. Yeah. Really, a, Content, you know? really a great guy. He really, really a visionary. Uh, Frank, yeah, Frank is one of my heroes. Frank Marks, engineering president of ABC at that time. So this is Wide World of Sports. This really Wide World of Sports had been on a year or two already, but it really wasn't taking off. And the instant replay did it. That was it, all on its own. All three of the networks had problems with the unions, trade unions, with their cameramen and the tape recorder guys. ABC wanted to introduce this two-inch wide helical machine at the uh, Democratic conference in 64. Uh, the guys didn't like it because it's too easy to operate. All you had to do was put the tape on and hit play. That's it. Quad machine, there's no way. You would be very lucky if you ever got a machine where you could hit the play button and it played. <laughs> you got mechanical and electrical adjustments. You had to get down on boards with a screwdriver. Uh, the union guys wouldn't allow me to touch a machine. Uh, so Frank Marks had one of the machines taken into his office so I could work on it. You know, so we were, we were, what ABC wanted to do was to have the machine and the station wagon going down the boardwalk with 100% humidity. You, know, you got the sea spray and the fog coming out of the air. It's just really, you know, I, said, I told Frank, I said, Frank, you can't play. You know, you just look at this machine. You have four inch wide of tape on there with all this water. You can't play a tape. He put his arm around me and said, son, the word can't is not in my vocabulary. So. See, in the fall of 1964, ABC only had 4% of the viewing audience of, in the, in the uh, national, Democratic National Convention in Atlantic City. And with 4%, they were going to go under. So they had to have some trick in their bag <laughs> pull out and the uh, uh, stop action slow motion, which is what I called it, later got called instant replay. That's what saved ABC. So they used that in the wide world of sports, which came up you know, a couple of weeks after the Democratic Convention. Anyway, it's a Saturday night <laughs> in Atlantic City, uh, National Convention going on at the Convention Center. And he had his gopher go out and get six electric blankets, because he had six machines, six of our two-inch helical machines. And this, the guy came back with six blankets, plugged it in. Each car had 110 volt alternators on each uh, station wagon. And it worked. It was incredible. So that's how they got by with it. That's the first time we ever used the machine in the field. What he, Frank Mark says, it has to work. We have 4% of the viewing audience for the Democratic Convention. If we don't get that 4% up much higher, a lot higher, we're going out of business. ABC. 
ABC. Um, well, it was Ron Aldridge, Frank Marks, and me, in my opinion. You saved ABC. Yeah, the three of us together. I mean, without being working together on it, really. So, uh, what they did with the sport, the reason he had six machines is he could put the, the video recorders around the field, you know, one up above, and, uh, and this is the first time they had the opportunity because they had gigantic, you know, one ton, oh, I didn't ever say, the two inch quad machines weighed like a half a ton. To a ton each. I'm not kidding. How I'm big crap. were they compared to a one-inch machine? 19 inch wide and usually two racks of six uh, feet each and then the console. So two take rack? up two th racks for one machine? Or three if it's color of three. Yeah, it's incredible. That's why we went for the small 90 pound unit <laughs> at $15,000.